Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. I'm joined once again, and probably for the last time in this series, by Graham from Music City Acoustics in Nashville. Graham, how's it going? Great. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. And uh, we're basically about to wrap up this four-part, or now five-part series uh, going through the treatment of your demo room over in Nashville. For everybody who's watching this video kind of first, I want you to go back and watch parts one through four that I've <clears> linked <throat> down in the description. We're basically going through the main steps of treating this demo room. So starting by looking at the empty room, positioning the desk and speakers, planning the treatment in the second room, installing the treatment, obviously, then going through all the measurements from start to finish so you can see what happens at each step of the process and how the response in the room actually changes as new treatment is introduced into the room. And then in the final and fourth video, we went through installing membrane traps, resonance absorbers to take care of that very, very deep low end. So again, if you haven't watched those, go back and have a look at them before you go and watch this video. Because in this video, we're gonna go through your questions. So we had a bunch of questions come in throughout this series. And so we're just gonna do a Q&A session to go through all your questions and answer anything that popped up. Um, so I've prepared a whole list here and I'm just gonna go through them with Graham and we're just gonna kind of jump in and, uh, and answer them as we go along. Graham, are you ready? Let's do it. Let's do it. So starting with video one, this was about placing the desk and speakers. And I've got a question here by Paul Bishop. And he says, nice video, thanks for sharing. I'll just add that 38% of the room length, a rule of thumb coined by Wes Lachot, when designing rooms with flush mounted monitors, puts the listening position almost exactly at the null of the fourth harmonic of the length axial. With treatment, it's less of an issue as this will be pretty high and easily treatable, but why start there if you can have a better starting point? I find about roughly between 31 and 32% is a better starting point as it is between nulls and peaks of the first four harmonics. That's quite detailed. Did you catch that, Graham? Did you get that? That's it, yeah. <laughs> um, I cut response? out a lot of the words, but I got it. Yeah. Um, uh, what's, what's your answer? What's our answer? Yeah, I mean, I think, I'm not that good at math, so I couldn't tell you off of the 38% or 31, 32% whether or not that is the fourth harmonic or not and how that correlates to your room without sure. actually drawing it up. Um, but I think the most important thing and most of what we showed in that first video is that you can use that as a rule of thumb or as a starting point, but first and foremost, you should always listen. And, yeah. you know, the the listening test that we did, find the, you know, your base hunter technique of of putting a speaker or sub in the corner, listening to the room, moving back and forth. That's the most important thing. So it could be 38%, it could be 56%. The numbers are pretty arbitrary. What we yeah. ultimately care about is finding the spot that works best in your room. Yeah. And so, yeah, if, if 30, if truly the math works better on that, then I don't know that people should stop saying 38%. But it's like, ultimately, <laughs> yeah. ultimately nothing's more important than listening in your room. And if you want yeah. to take that a step further, then take measurements in your room. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think for the most part, throw out the math in that regard and, and really focus on what's happening in your space because rooms are unique. And yeah. the reason those things are good starting points or rules of thumb is because they're not always right. Um, yeah. And they don't account for all the, the unique characteristics of each room. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, couldn't have said it better. Um, let's move on to the next one here. This is by ALJ Studios. And they say... A Problem with AMROC is it only accounts for square and rectangular room shapes, doesn't account for jogs, sloped ceilings, or unparalleled walls. Same with REW. I used both in an oddly shaped room and they helped, but they aren't exact for my room. So, I mean, let me just throw in there maybe first, obviously, yes, AMROC very true this, all these uh, models only work in very uh, kind of an ideal uh, rectangular rooms, 
but uh, I'm not sure why you're saying this about REW. Obviously, REW is a, uh, right? That's probably I what think, you were about to say. No, I think he's talking about there's a room simulator function within REW. Gotcha. And it does only work, you can only put in rectangular rooms or dimensions for rectangular rooms. Um, it's actually a very pretty cool function within REW because it is. it goes a bit beyond what AMROC does and allows you to actually position speakers within the room and the listening position to move them and start to see the projected frequency response. Yeah. Um, so it will do the math to kind of calculate where your sidewall reflections, SBIRs, those those types of things are happening. And you can put in different absorption coefficients yeah. for all the boundaries within that. Um, so it's a pretty cool tool. You can also export that into like an actual measurement so you can kind of analyze what different perspective speaker placement or listening positions are, would mm -hmm. be. I've done it a lot in rooms. I then tested those things in those rooms. It can get you close, but it's never the same. So it's like the same thing with the 38% <clears throat> rule, like, or 32, 31%, whatever, whatever mathematically works out to be best. They're, they're going to get you close, but listen, you know, try things, move them around. It's always going to work better. I think so. Both of those, I understand the rectangular thing that is unfortunately just sort of a struggle within acoustics. When you're dealing with spaces that aren't rectangular, they, very quickly get incredibly hard to calculate um, yeah. because you constantly have changing dimensions. I think one of the the bigger takeaways, if you're trying to use those tools, if your room has one angled ceiling or one angled wall or the ceilings angled, those rooms still very much so have room modes. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like those things dissipate or go away. Um, typically, if you have splayed walls, angled walls, a vaulted ceiling, most of the benefit that you're going to have from that is going to be higher up in the frequency range. Uh, it takes a pretty significant angle or pretty large wall in order to actually affect more of your low frequency stuff. Um, but unfortunately, it is still quite hard to predict it once you start changing those angles. Um, there's not really a better solution out there for him. It's just sort of the downside, you know, the uh, potential upside to a room that's not rectangular is that. Uh, you have better high frequency and maybe mid frequency responses or less, at least flutter echoes within those spaces. Um, the downside is that you have no way to really predict what's happening and you can't, uh, well, that's pretty much it. You just can't predict what's happening and there's not a yeah. huge benefit or really any benefit typically in the low end. <clears throat> yeah. And it's also once because things are so unpredictable, it's really, really hard to chase down exact problems after after the fact yeah. if you're like if you're kind of going through the treatment process and you're trying to identify certain problems uh, certain specific issues it can get really really difficult because the models don't work <laughs> right so uh, so at that point you're like you're down left you're left basically with just experimentation and you yeah. don't have the models to check against your experiments and that can make it really really uh, tricky to to understand mm -hmm. what's going on um, one little th addition also, which is nice about the, the modeling in Rumi Q Wizard is that, you, well, at least the, um, the room mode modeling is that you can actually have it uh, show that laid on top of your, uh, your measurements so, um, right. so that you can, you can hopefully more easily identify uh, uh, which exact room modes are causing which issues. Are we, are we, um, is, is your dog trying to, uh, to crash our conversation? I think he wants to go out. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have to wait, buddy. Gotta love a good studio dog. Just wants to go roam the rest of the office and say hi to everybody. Yeah, understandably. So, moving on to the next one. This is by Kai Thera, Dream Project Records. Just skipped through. What are the speaker stands here? They look like solving the problem of a two wide desk that forces your stereo triangle somewhat larger than ideal looking expensive though <laughs> they are unfortunately not cheap um they're not the most expensive stands out there but they're they're definitely not cheap and it's not a very fun thing to buy but they're they're sound anchor stands mm -hmm. um it's a company based here in the in in the u.s i think they're based in florida um and they make really good stands they're just they're super solid they're heavy and uh, probably most importantly, they're height adjustable. Mm -hmm. And so, so often you'll see speaker stands where there's a fixed height. And unless that height perfectly matches the box of your speaker, um, you're probably not going to have your speakers at the correct height in your room. And so 
whether it's sound anchor stands, uh, which are obviously, I think, are great stands, but any other stand, you know, most importantly, it's something that's going to be pretty hefty. It has a lot of weight to it, so that's not going to be sliding around or even having the tiniest movements with your speakers um, or allowing the speaker to move back and forth because we want your speaker pushing air. We don't want the speaker moving the stand at all. Mm-hmm. And um, and then having a speaker stand that's height adjustable, I think, is pretty much the most critical factor when you're looking at stands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaker stands. Uh, how fun! Uh, a, 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 how fun! A world in its own. Um, <clears throat> it's a uh, not not the sexiest thing you could buy, and you could buy a lot of a lot of junk. You could buy a lot of ice cream. You could buy a lot of anything that's a lot more fun than speaker stands, but they are important. Yeah. They are very important. Yeah. Uh, so this next one is by Tom Highland. I'm trying to find more space for bass trapping. It's a very small room and I have a big bump at 50 hertz. One place I haven't put any bass traps is under the speakers where the speaker stands are. I'm thinking about building some large bass trap squares underneath the speaker st- uh, in- underneath the speakers instead of stands. Any idea if that is totally crazy idea? I've not seen anybody do it do anything similar. So I, the first part of his question sounds like he's just like he has the speakers on stands. Mm-hmm. And I guess this depends on your stance because my stands, like the upright post for it is here and then the speaker is here. So you actually could put a bass trap directly below it. In his case, it sounds like maybe he's got stands and he wants to build bass traps and then put his speakers on the bass traps. That's um, right, yeah. That can work if you build the bass traps properly. Um but it's kind of tricky to do in terms of getting the actual framing for your bass trap solid enough to where it's not going to resonate at all. Wood is the most common thing we obviously build bass traps out of in terms of the framing for it. It will resonate um, if you put a speaker directly on top of it. So it has to be really well dampened in addition to bass trapping. It, so it could work. It probably wouldn't be the first thing that I would look at. Um, or at least not replacing your speaker stands, maybe trying to put them on each side of it. And ultimately, put a, put them where you can. It's not, you yeah. know, if you're short on space, wherever you can put them, it's probably going to help. But if you go, th- you know, watching like our video in part three, where we go through all the different measurements and um, we put bass reps on the floor directly below the speakers in terms of like having big impacts in your room, that's generally not the area where you're gonna make. You're gonna see the biggest changes. Yeah, that's exactly what I would have said. And I've I've done a bit of experimenting with that, and I I didn't come to the conclusion that it was worth the effort. Um, yeah. And I mean, you got to think about it this way, right? What are you trying to do? What 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 can you possibly get from putting a bass trap right underneath the speaker? Well, potentially, speaker boundary issues with the floor. If you make them large enough, you, maybe you can catch the floor reflection back to the listening position. And then obviously any uh, any just standard room modes that might have a velocity maximum at that particular position where the, those speaker stand bass traps are now located. But um, this the speaker boundary interference thing with the floor, I just haven't seen it that much. Uh, it doesn't really seem to happen. Um, we've seen in your tests and i've seen that as well that the floor reflection isn't necessarily something you really want to get rid of <laughs> um <Yeah. laughs> and there it's a long long debate about what how and why and why not why yes and why not um and then when we're talking about actual room mode damping surface area comes into play right and just having kind of smallish stands or base traps that work as stands just don't do all that much um, in terms of in terms of actual room mode control because they're just too small. And so, yeah, I mean, if you're just if you're trying to squeeze out as much usable space for base trapping as possible, sure, why not? The the um, like it's probably not going to do any harm, probably, hopefully, but yeah. um, but it's the benefit is probably not great. One, I guess, maybe like interesting take on this, which isn't what I thought of when he, when you were reading the question. But as like looking at my room, if you built basically like a false wall or mm-hmm. front that had a shelf and like mm-hmm. that was built rigidly enough to actually place your speakers on, um, then you're starting to cover you know a lot of area potentially a foot or so off of your front wall yep. 
even two feet, like in this case. Um, so there's like ways in which I think you could do it. You could, you know, I could basically build out like all the way across the room directly underneath those speakers, a two foot deep by 10 foot wide base trap. And that would certainly, that would certainly have a that would, that would a pretty beneficial something. impact in a lot of ways. So there's definitely ways to do it. Um, and at that point, you basically what you're doing is going kind of partially towards flush mounting your speakers, right? Right. It's, it's sort of like half, half without, without the, without the boundaries. So then it gets into a whole yeah. other, yeah. uh, whole other scenario. Cause you don't really want to exactly. flush mount. You, if they're flush mounted, they need to be <laughs> in the wall. You're just going to leave it yeah, at yeah. that. <laughs> Keep that simple. If you're flush mounting your speakers or thinking about it, they have to go in the wall. Don't build a half fake thing, wall. Whatever. Yeah. 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 So anyway, uh, I think that answered that question, right? Yeah. <laughs> as, as best as we can. Moving on. This one is by Dylan Hall. Wow. This is so dope. <laughs> both, both of these guys, I literally have been watching and rewatching each of their video videos. These guys are revolutionizing DIY music studios. One day I would love to meet each of them. Hi, praise. Thank you very much, Dylan. Um, would love to meet you as well. I'm, I'm glad you appreciate uh, what we do. Yeah. So this next one is by Sven. Wait, there was, a, there was a question there, right? There was no question. This was okay, just great. me uh, okay, <laughs> making cool. a note of somebody loving our videos. <laughs> well, thanks, Dylan. This, th thank you, Dylan. Moving on. This one is by Underdog Electronic Music School. Shout out to Oscar. Um, this is so freaking awesome. Thanks, Yesco and Graham for this. Um, sending you much love, Oscar. Thanks for commenting. Uh, he runs Underdog Electronic Music School. For anybody who's into electronic music production, should check out his channel and his tutorials and everything. Uh, he does a really, really great job. Um, so yeah, thanks for that, Oscar. Here's one from Orlan or or. Orloanis, <laughs> uh, do you think that moving microphone method, do you think that moving microphone method might be more accurate to judge a place and not a spot to install the seat and or speaker position? So I guess he what he, what they're asking is is it more accurate to use a microphone for positioning your desk uh, your listening position and speakers rather than your ears? Oh, interesting. That's not what I thought that meant. I cuz there's you like think you it can means? like there are there's times where people will take measurements or a method of taking measurements where you actually like move the microphone right. around while playing right. like pink noise. Um okay. so less you wouldn't do it with the sign sweep cuz things just get weird. But if you're playing pink noise and then you average out that response. So you get more of like an average <laughs> of this area or mm -hmm. with sonar I thought of like or maybe like he's used sonar works and is familiar mm -hmm. with like their 30 positions or whatever it is and Yeah. Um if it's the first one, I don't so much know. I mean, I would say it's it's like, how do you define accurate? You know, like at this point, accurate in terms of measurements, accurate in terms of what you're hearing. Um, I can tell you that you can get pretty damn accurate by just using your ears. Surprisingly accurate. The, um, the fun thing is, or the great thing is, is that it doesn't just account for the kind of um, uh, objective balance, tonal balance, but it, it accounts for your taste as well. So some people will prefer a more sort of a bigger bottom end. Some people prefer slightly lighter mids. And you're basically, you're choosing your listening position based on your test, uh, based on your ears and your taste as much as uh, the the kind of the objective truth of what an ideal tonal balance should sound like. And so that is actually an advantage, right? So maybe you've heard about something called house curves. Back in the days, this is something that was kind of thrown around a lot. This is when you're tuning or rather toning your uh, sound system, your speaker system to your particular taste. And you'd basically do slight EQ adjustments to the tonal balance in order to get the representation, the tonal representation closer to what you actually like to hear. And by using your ears, 
in these positioning techniques, you're you're doing that. You're kind of moving closer to that automatically without without uh, without having to think about it. And that's, in my opinion, actually an advantage. So um, are measurements more accurate for this placement stuff than your ears? To be honest, I would probably say it's it's probably pretty similar. the The problem with the measurements is that it can get really, really difficult to judge what is best if you've taken 20 measurements at different positions i guarantee that you won't know which one to pick <laughs> um so uh and it's actually much easier to make that decision by ear yeah so that's my answer yeah i think and then just can you read the question one more time sure it's do you think that moving microphone method might be more accurate to judge a place and not a spot to install the seat or and the speaker position. Okay. Just in case he does mean like actually like moving the microphone uh -huh. for your measurements. Um, yeah. I don't think it's more accurate in terms of like finding the listening position or speaker mm -hmm. placement. Apparently neither does Barley. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, mainly because what it will do is as if you're taking measurements you're taking measurements over mold, a larger area and yeah. it averages all of those yes which is beneficial if you're trying to determine like what your eq setting should be yeah if because you actually trying, want to know because you're, because you're trying to get an average eq curve over and that works over a larger area that's the whole idea right. of taking but all if, those measurements Exactly. But if you truly want to pinpoint like where your chair should be glued to the ground or where your speaker <laughs> should be, having one reference point is going to give you a more detailed, accurate response. Yeah. And then that's the foundation for everything else. And then from there, yeah, you could go on to, you know, taking more of an average um, averaging approach to figuring out, okay, what do I actually need to do? Because you don't really want to go in there surgically and start EQing a bunch of things. You want no. broader, subtle changes that just help correct the balance of things. We always, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about it a bunch, but ultimately the goal is to have a balanced response, not to have a super flat. So you're not going to go in there and like with a Q of a hundred and, you know, extra six dB at a hundred Hertz and then cut 120 Hertz by seven dB or 20 dB. It's like broad, wide Q changes to help just correct the balance. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that answers the question. Whichever way it was intended. Yeah, I hope we got it. So um, this next one is by Matt Cohen. Tangential inquiry, inquiry here at Music City Acoustics. Where did you get that desk? I like the design. Uh, we built the desk. Or I built the desk. Um, it was just kind of I was you know experimenting with or trying to come up with ideas of how you could build a desk and have a desk still without completely getting rid of it that didn't create a bunch of desk reflection issues. Um, so I went with this slatted design. It's the first and only one that we've built. Um, but there have been a lot of questions about it. So we're thinking about whether or not we can put plans together for a desk like this, um, or one day potentially build them. So if you're interested, definitely, uh, sign up for our newsletter. We will, if we ever do make plans for it or start producing them in any way, we'll definitely let everybody know. Um, otherwise it's a pretty basic slatted desk. So if you have you know, look up some ideas on slatted benches, tables, whatever it may be. You can definitely implement this kind of thing into a desk. And it does work really well to reduce uh, most of the typical desk reflections that you would see. If you want to if you want to check that out, uh, we uh, we looked at some some measurements um, in video three, I believe. Um, so looking at what the desk does or doesn't do really. Yeah. yeah. So check that out. Um, thank you. So this is the first one by Undercrown Hip Hop. Why not push slats on everything if it's a mixing slash tracking room? Or maybe better question is, where would you not want to put the slats in a mixing tracking room for vocals and guitar? Uh, I think the the short answer is, is don't put them super close to your speakers. Yeah. Or in a tracking room, um, 
And this is where it's like, it sounds like his is probably a combination or theirs is probably a combination of mixing. It's like tracking and mixing in one space. If it was like an actual vocal booth um, and you didn't have some distance away from the source and the microphone, I probably wouldn't put them in there. Um, As with all diffusion or scattering, you need some space between your source and the actual diffuser to get the full effect of that diffuser. Um, so that's really kind of just the main thing is just don't put it too close in terms of like, why wouldn't you put it everywhere? Um, if it's truly like the scatter, like this type of scatter face or, you know, 2d binary diffuser, you could, uh, if you like the sound of it, it's not something that like really increases the decay time in the room. So it's not like you're going to put these everywhere and all of a sudden have a one second decay time. Um, when you have the absorber diffuser combination, uh, a lot of that kind of comes down to the preference of what do you want your space to sound like? So it's not so much that you can't, but you don't need to. What w- the goal of them is to really give our ear a sense of space. So we want to be able to treat the entirety of this room with absorption so that we get the low end control that we're searching for and reduce reflections off this, you know, all of our boundaries, reduce speaker boundary interference and control room modes, obviously, all the things we've been talking about. But we need to have some sense of reflections so that our head, like basically that our brains don't go crazy. Our our brains are always trying to figure out what room are we in? How big is it? Um, and having reflections allow our brain to, you know, hear the, the space itself. And that's what really reduces the fatigue. So you're not like constantly overthinking subconsciously about where you are. Yeah. Um So it's a kind of a weird psychoacoustic effect, which is why it's not super important where they go or how many of them they are. It's more important that they're there and that there's a balance between uh, at least to some extent, your high frequency decay time, your low frequency decay time, and that we can hear some reflections. Yeah. And I mean, the, the, to the question of, of how much the unfortunate answer is you need to figure that out yourself. Uh, it's a taste thing more than anything, and to and particular to your particular your room, and so uh, it's something that you need to figure out yourself. You could do it everywhere. Uh, it does give a curious <laughs> room impression. I've done that once, yeah. <laughs> and it is it is it is definitely interesting. I wouldn't recommend it um, to start off with because it's easy enough to also just add them in later, right? Because you just add them to the front of any absorption, right? So um, yeah it's easy enough to do some experimentation with. Um, but yeah, otherwise, perfect answer. I couldn't, couldn't have better said it better myself. This next one is by Paul Mallet. You talk a lot about symmetry being good. I have a highly irregular attic space with multiple angled ceiling components in a 140-year-old Victorian house. My frequency response is lumpy, but I kind of think that I get a lot of diffusion because of really irregular reflections, question mark. I guess this is the, the the age old question is, is it good that I'm in a highly irregular space? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, most likely the answer to that is no. Uh, but it also comes down to like, what is the space used for? If it was a tracking room, absolutely. Um, you know, if you're trying to track strings or drums, that's great because it's not going to have some of the more stereotypical uh you know, small home studio sounds to it where like the boxiness of the drums, you're, the, the space itself will have more of a unique sound. If it's a mixing environment, symmetry is hugely uh, beneficial and important to having a very accurate stereo image and being things being very consistent to left and right. Um, so ultimately, is it beneficial to have an asymmetrical room if you're trying to monitor in there? No. There are some things, like he said, that can happen. And we talked about earlier, um, you're going to have less flutter echo. You will have a more even dispersion of reflections throughout the space because they're not just bouncing back and forth. They actually are taking Hope- kind of unique paths all around the room. By the way, yeah. yes. disclaimer, hopefully, right? I mean, this right. is not set in stone. It doesn't mean it necessarily gets bigger, better, but go ahead and continue. Yeah. yeah. And then if you look at like, and so, yes, hopefully, because it very much so depends on like, how that walls are splayed and angled. If you look at the more common, like non-rectangular studio designs, they typically were designed to reflect that energy like beyond the listening position, but to somewhere in the room where it would be absorbed. Yeah. 
So it's a very controlled reflection that allows you to not necessarily treat every surface and to retain some more energy. So maybe you don't need the scattering or the diffusion. You can just have that reflection that you don't hear very much of because it goes behind you. Um, in a unique room, it might work out really well, but it also um, can create some other problems. Flip side of that is if you are monitoring in there and you if the room's big enough or at least has the space for freestanding panels, in terms of like your high and mid frequencies, you can still create a very accurate stereo image left to right consistency just by treating that with freestanding panels. Um, and then if you're tracking in there, leave a lot of that untreated so you do get the benefit of the, you know, the unique space that it is. Um, but ultimately, if you're trying to design a control room or a mixer room, the, the more symmetrical it is, the easier time you will have setting it up and, and getting things going. Yeah. <clears throat> Agreed. Nothing to add. Um, great answer. This next one is by Juan Jose. Thank you for the acoustic treatment videos with measurements made with REW. Does the porous filling of the panels that pass through the air flow? Odd question. Does the porous filling of the panels that pass through the airflow have in kilopascal seconds by meter squared? I guess he's asking uh, what the actual uh, gas flow resistance of your panels is of the material inside. In the fourth video, can you put the group delay ETC Clarity C50? Um, let me maybe just ask, answer this second one. Uh, we decided not to show too much of the um, energy time curve, impulse, res impulse response uh, related data because it's, um, it's very, it can be very confusing and it takes quite a while to explain what, what you see. Um, so that we, we decided consciously to leave that out. Um, clarity, C50, I, th I don't think the clarity measurement is useful in a home studio. Um, it's great in like bigger spaces. It's great um, in bigger spaces. Yeah, yeah. It's, this is meant for... A, for sp go ahead. I was just saying, like, in a, yeah, I don't look at it in a studio setting or in a small, yeah. in a like control room setting. Uh, yeah. Venues, churches, tracking rooms... You can get more info. Tracking rooms a little bit less so because you're not really dealing with speech, which is C50 exactly. is intended for music. C80 is more like speech, larger spaces. <clears throat> um, this probably doesn't make sense to most people, but uh, it's just a ratio of like direct and reflected sound. Um, yeah. For those wondering, the yeah. Uh, but if they do want to look at those things, they can download the whole measurement set. We do have that available. So uh, we'll link it down if below. he is curious... Um, or if anybody else is in that fourth video, you can download all the measurements and dive into any of those aspects. One note on the group delay is that I didn't take those measurements with a timing reference. Um, so you're not going to get a lot of information about the group delay. There you go. So, and then uh, on the question of what the, uh, what the gas flow resistance of the material is that you use. Great question. Um, I don't really. Oh, actually, I do know because I had to look it up. I saw that question. Um, it is a six pound density and they had the information on it. I don't know what it. I think it's 40. So right. it is pretty high. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is higher. So, And this is I. this is kind of one of those things where it's like. There is. I think it's like, it gets a little complicated in the sense of if you start looking at calculations for like, do you want it to be 40K? Do you want it to be 10K? Um, you get two pretty different answers based off of that math. And then if you start looking at NRC ratings, you get two very different, um, typically you'll get two very different NRC ratings for products with those different densities. So if you look at like four inches of a six pound density product compared to four inches of a one pound, two pound, three pound product. The six pound product normally works a lot better, but if you look at the gas flow math, you'd have it flipped mm -hmm. to where the lower gas flow resistivity is gonna work a little bit better. So uh, it, this question has kind of sparked a, a good bit of curiosity in my mind in terms of like really figuring out what's going on there and why. Um, I think 
I don't know if we've talked about, but I think we both, you, I know you've written about it and NRC ratings and the, the testing that's done for acoustics, um, is pretty horrific. It's just not consistent. It's not accurate. And so along with the math, like the math's helpful, but real world experience, I've done a lot of testing with like purely fluffy, low density insulation. This works better Mm -hmm. in the right applications. Um, so I've done like, you know, three feet deep of this in a corner versus three feet deep of fluffy. Uh, I wouldn't do three feet deep of six pound mineral wool or 703. And I wouldn't really do three feet of fluffy by itself. It's like the best combination I found is similar to what we ended up doing in these corners where six inches of the six pound with fluffy insulation behind it. So mixing those densities where you're both mixing the actual density and the gas flow resistivity of those two things. Um, I wish I had a better answer in terms of like why, if you do the math purely looking at gas flow resistivity, you would say you should use a lower um, number. And then if you look at the densities, typically it would go up a little bit higher. Those There's not a s- strong correlation to like what I've seen in real world testing there, um, which is never a fun thing because it's hard to explain. But I am now very curious in terms of like, you know, how much further could we take that and, and really figuring out, okay, if you look at a four pound product, which brings that gas flow resistivity down to like 20,000 or something um, and beyond. Ultimately, it's like the materials, they, they definitely matter. So it's not like just go build them with anything, but most things are going to work really well in your space. Um, and we can get really into the math, but I'm not very good at math and I'm very good at building things and putting them in a room and taking way too many measurements. And so uh, that's kind of how we've landed on like putting fluffy behind the mineral wall in the corners, anywhere with those kind of combinations, it always does seem to work the best. And we've got plenty of measurements to show the kind of that data in terms of comparing, pairing all the different possibilities. Yeah. I think the only thing I can add is just be aware that for anybody watching that the tolerances of effectiveness are, um, are, are very large. So it's, so even though we have maths that spits out accurate answers, that um, the, 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 the tolerances that you actually get with real world materials are much, much larger for various reasons. And, um, and that makes it very, very, very hard if you're DIYing to pick the right material, which is why in my courses, I teach a way to work around that issue. Yeah, because it is very, very difficult if you're DIYing and you only have a bunch of materials available with very little data uh, to make the perfect decision. Yeah, and the other thing to to keep in mind is that what you do with that material is as important as the material that you pick, Pro- possibly more important. So. Um, so that's that's just something to keep in mind with this entire discussion about the actual density, gas flow resistance, picking the exact materials and stuff. You got to see it in the context of what you're trying to do, and then um, and then problem solve. And uh, yeah, if you want to have some some more guidance on that, check out my course, Build a Better Base Trap, where I walk you through that exact process. Right. Yeah. The the last thing is, <clears throat> I hate to be the person who's like the don't look at the data because I think, you know, <laughs> doing the math and understanding the science behind it is hugely important. And it's the foundation for everything that we do. Um, but if you're, you know, if, if you are out there like looking for different insulation products and which to use and really trying to compare NRC ratings and saying, hey, this one's 0.7 at 125 hertz and this one's 0.83 at 125 hertz, um, you can go with the one that's a tiny bit higher in terms of like, Will it make any sort of noticeable difference in your room? Absolutely not. Um, None whatsoever. Yeah. The testing just like isn't, they put like a seven by seven foot square in a room on the floor, normally on the floor. There's different mounting techniques and then play a sound in a reverb chamber and they measure the change in decay time. Um, it varies so much from like one lab to another or even just one test to another that the data is not very conclusive and so if you if you're like trying to compare one insulation product to another you're not going to learn much about it um ultimately fortunately they all work pretty well 
And so yeah. it's like put them, and this is why, you know, we've spent so much time showing you the differences that occur depending on where they go. Yeah. Because the depth of them and where you place them is always going to be the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Let's leave it at that. Um, Angelo Bolton, Boltini asks, Bolton, I'm not sure if there's an I at the end there. You mentioned the corner traps being placed in a spot with most air velocity. What does that actually mean? Isn't air velocity and sound always highest the further you get from the walls? Um, what does that actually mean? Yes. The, it, me, <laughs> it's two questions. Basically the same question. Shall I grab this uh, one? Go for it. Yeah. So yeah. The, the thing to understand here is that a sound wave, we you typically characterize a sound wave by two components, sound pressure and sound velocity. Um, and we're not talking about the speed of sound here. We're talking about a different um, metric, which measures the basically the movement of the air molecules. And the thing to understand is that sound pressure and, and, and velocity are always inversed. They're exactly out of phase, if you will. And so a point in space that has maximum air pressure always has minimum velocity. Now, the point with these porous absorbers is, is that they work by friction of the molecules with the fibers. And so you need to position them in a spot with the highest air velocity, right? If, the, if you have a, a wave, a sound wave, and you have one wavelength of sound pressure, you have exactly the same wavelength of air velocity, uh, of sound velocity, but it's, it's, it's exactly moved, it's exactly shifted, so they, they're inversed, pressure and velocity, right? But so, if, um, so if, if sound pressure is maximum right at the wall, let's say the edge of my screen here is the, is the wall, then it obviously, depending on the frequency and the wavelength, it drops to a minimum at a certain distance from the wall, and that's where you'll get maximum air velocity. But then air pressure increases again, and then you get minimum air velocity uh, velocity again. Um, and so you can't just go further and further from the wall for a particular frequency, because the, the, um, the, the velocity curve follows the same sinusoidal pattern as the pressure curve. But obviously, the further you go away from the wall, the lower down in frequency you'll be able to reach because the wavelengths are much longer and that point of highest velocity is further and further away from the wall. Yeah? So in that sense, going further and further away from the wall increases your, your ability to absorb lower frequencies, but it doesn't increase your ability for one particular frequency. That's my version. Cool. That's great. It, uh, <laughs> Anything to add? Don't don't no. I think like if you're treating corners, don't push a bunch of insulation into the corner. Yeah, is the you know it, it because of exactly what you just said. Getting it out in front of that corner um, just puts the base trap in an area where you have higher velocity, so more particle movement. Um, velocity is probably kind of a confusing way of thinking about it. It really is particle movement, right? So it's like yeah. air particles. Um, I think what it's you like said was great. They vibrate. Like, it's they like they vibrate. Go, yeah. So it's why <laughs> when we talk, like I could hold a, a flame right in front of my face, mm -hmm. and unless I say a word that starts with a P or a B or like a plosive, so the same things that you use a pop filter for, because when you say those those consonants or those letters, you're actually pushing air out of your mouth. So it's like you're blowing out a candle. If you're just talking. I could hold a flame here all day and just avoid certain words and I'd never blow it out because you're not like pushing any air. So they're just moving back and forth. We want to put it in a spot where they're going like this and running into each other as opposed to like where they're moving like this. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the, the, the question of the corners, the cor corners, this is the exact same thing happens in the corners, in front of the corners as in front of the walls. The geometry of it is slightly more complicated, um, but that's pretty much it. The same principles apply. Yeah. Okay, cool. So while moving on to a question by Ratio, spelled very interestingly. Thanks for this quality content. Can you hear less noise in the next room or flat below when music is played loud after the room treatment? Thank you. Yes. 
absolutely. Um, that's not to say that like treating a room is a form of isolating it or soundproofing it. Um, but treating a room does have an impact on that. So there, it is harder, you know, if I have that door open and I yell out to somebody out there in, in the other offices, it's much harder to hear me now. Um, and vice versa, less sound kind of comes in or you hear less of that sound as it comes in. But it's not like if you really want to be able to work on your music and you've got a lot of low end and you're in an apartment, this isn't going to help like save your relationship with your neighbors. Um, most likely I wouldn't recommend this as a form of like actual isolation, but it does have an impact on it. Um, in the same way that if you get into like how STC, so sound transmission, um, tests are taken those ratings. If you have, you know, it's a speaker on one side or a sound source on one side in a room, there's a wall or a partition or a boundary, a microphone on the other side. If you treat that room where the microphone is, you'll actually see a pretty big drop in your STC rating um, or a big improvement. Sorry, it'll go. Um, so it certainly has an impact, but it is not a true like means of isolating or soundproofing a room. Yeah, I mean, um, maybe to to get a bit more technical, you're not changing the 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 ability of sound to transmit through the wall. So the wall doesn't change its isol its isolating properties by putting treatment on top of it, not to a significant degree. But what you are right. doing is absorbing a lot of that energy in that room that is created. And so if there's an opening, and that's what you were talking about before, right? If there's an opening, like a door, you have a lot less energy that is uh, finds its way through the door because a lot of it is absorbed before. And so that's why any, any, uh, any, any sound in the next room will be a lot quieter. But it is not because the isolation of the wall structure has changed. Yeah. Yeah. It's all, I mean, it's mostly, well, there's two things inside the room. It's mostly your perception. So like sounds from outside of this room coming in, the impact of those are reduced significantly. Um, so in that regard, the room itself is much quieter because if sound from like our shop, which is to, just to my left, is coming in. So they're running saws or building stuff out there. That sound comes in this room. It doesn't now bounce off of all the walls and reverberate. So I might hear it but it's not bouncing around. So my perception of it is that it's much, much, much quieter. It's a much calmer environment. Um, in the same way that if I talk, there's a lot less energy now that can travel out of the room because a lot of it gets absorbed. Just as much of it, as you said, can go through the wall because the wall isn't a better performing boundary, but the effects of the sound in the room or trying to leave the room are different. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool, next one. Jeff Salvatore asks or says, great video. Do you guys offer consulting and acoustic design services? I have the means to build my own panels, but would be really interested in you guys helping me design the room. Um, yeah, so quick shout out for the both of us. Obviously, I'm the DIY guy. Graham is the, the one with uh, the shop that builds all the panels. Um, we both do uh, consulting work. Um, so depending on what you need, get in touch with us. Uh, so I'll put our, I guess our, uh, our contact information in the description as well. Um, but yeah, we both help with, uh, people building out their rooms. So definitely get in touch. Um, and, uh, and we'll figure out what, uh, what works best for you. Um, this next one is by Robert K from fixation studios. <clears throat> is there a rigid backing on these panels? Is there any benefit to building the air gap into the panel, basically thicker construction of sides, but rear still open? Or is it better to make the panel as thick as the absorption material and then just mount it with an air gap? I guess they are much of the same thing, but would one cut down on material? Um, there's not a rigid backing on the panels. Mm -hmm. So probably nine times out of 10, that would reduce the effectiveness of the panels, at least if there is an air gap. Um, if you put a rigid backing on the panels and you mount it flush to the wall, you're not really going to have any change there. Um, so ultimately with a panel, you don't want a rigid backing on it. It will increase your material cost. 
increase the weight of the panel and doesn't in any way really help the improvement um, or sorry, doesn't improve the performance of the panel. Oftentimes it will hinder or reduce the performance though. And then in terms of like, should you have the air gap built into the panels or install them with an air gap? It doesn't really matter uh, in terms of like performance. It's going to be the same. Where it does have a big impact is on the material cost of the panels. And certainly in our case, where we, we build a product and we ship it to people all over, our, all over the U.S., and when it comes to shipping cost, a huge portion of that is just what's the size of the package. And they're already big. So if we took our six inch, six and a half inch deep base traps, added another six and a half inches to it, um, there's a lot of money going into just the extra wood that it takes to make that 12 inches deep. Also a lot of money that goes into shipping it across the country. It's more fabric. Um, so it's a really ineffective way to achieve that air gap. Um, everything just gets like exponentially more expensive. It, and then on the flip, or not the flip side, but so one of the alternatives, there are some companies that do build air gaps into their panels, but it's typically like an inch and a half or a two inch air gap on a six inch deep panel. And it's not really the depth of the air gap that you want to see an increase in performance. Um, it's kind of something that's typically there more so to, so that they can say there's an air gap. Um, but it's not providing really the air gap that you want. So, I would say if you're building them, it comes down almost entirely to the aesthetic. Do you want one solid thing on your wall or on your ceiling that looks like it's mounted flush to the wall, but performs like it has an air gap? Or do you like the look of them pushed off, kind of floated off the wall or the ceiling a little bit? There's no right or wrong there. That's like purely an aesthetic thing. Um, but certainly from a cost and practicality standpoint, it's better to build them without the air gap. Yeah, agreed. Next one is by Halcyon Guitars. Are the front corner panels, as they are, superior in some way to having had the corner completely filled, aka super chunk style? Is it better to have air or mass? Um, so I would say yes, they are superior. Um, but there's a couple of things going on there. One, like okay, we the, just... the, the super chunk is superior. Oh, no, sorry. Not having either air or in this case the combination of materials so typically you see a super chunk and it's like people cut triangles there's two f at least two flaws to that one they're almost never the right size I mean, mm -hmm. so meaning they're too small yeah. um That's so like they the don't get far enough thing. out into the yeah. corner uh they'll take them and they'll be like two feet across um and 17 inches deep so it's like 12 inches front to back uh, these are, these have like, what, th two or three feet of air behind them, basically to the corner. So right in the middle, I think it's like two and a half feet. Um, so it's a much, much bigger thing. And you could build a super chunk this size where it gets more complicated is that if you're going to do that, you want to mix the densities of the insulation material that you're using. So going with a lot of lightweight, fluffy insulation to occupy a lot of that space closer to the wall and to the boundaries. And then moving further out, we use the, the six pound mineral wool that we have in our products. You could use four pound, three pound, whatever it is. But this construction style does work better um, in every test that I've done. And I've done like this exact thing, completely fold, filled with mineral, this exact thing, completely filled with fluffy, um, different combinations of depths of the two. Uh, this has always produced the best results, um, both in smoothing out the frequency response to the room and also the decay time of the room. So, I would, yes, it does work better. The other important factor here is that it's also a much more cost-effective way of doing it. So it's not just that it like performs better. Uh, it's easier to build and it costs less because you don't have to cut triangles and you're also not shoving a bunch of material into that corner that is a velocity absorber where there's no velocity. Yeah. I mean, you got to understand that the, the, the last few kind of two, three inches right up against the wall they do hardly anything for you anyway, uh, no matter what you put there, because there isn't any particle velocity there. There isn't any... Yeah, anything, at least at any, yeah. L low frequencies. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, so the, the, there is a... It's just having a panel in front of the corner is a somewhat a compromise, but less than you might think. Um, that's kind of how I see it. Yeah. Cool. 
Next one is by Haristian Spuk. I'm sorry, this is a difficult name. Bistrischki. Thanks for the video, guys. Awesome overview. Question for the Q&A. Graham, you can share some more details. Can you share some more details and thoughts on this nice desk of yours? Once again, about the desk. Is it comfortable? How does working on it with a mouse and keyboard feel with those gaps? And how did you manage to integrate external rack gear in a way that which makes sense ergonomically and acoustically? I find it super interesting idea and honestly wondering why I haven't seen starter desks used more often. From an acoustic standpoint, it seems to make total sense. Most important question, what would you, what would you like to change or wish you had made differently on that desk design? Uh, <clears throat> so first from like a comfortability, well, one, thank you. Um, it does work well and it's very comfortable to work at. Uh, I use a trackball. I don't use a mouse. Um, so I don't actually have to like move it around. I think if you were moving a mouse around, you'd probably want at least some sort of like it doesn't need to be super thick because the slots are only like this far apart. Um, so I can still put like a cup of coffee on it or a water bottle. You have to be a little careful, make sure you don't get it stuck in, in between the slots, but, um, but it holds things fine. So it's, it's very comfortable to work on. I round it over. There's no like super hard edges on it. So I, I round it over everything. Um, so it's not like you're cutting your hand on it or anything like that. So from a comfort and comfortability standpoint, it's great. The rack gear uh, is just kind of in the, the second half of the desk furthest away from me, I guess, or the back half. Um, and it's just, this is actually kind of, one, it's very easy to work with because it's just right in front of me, or right in front of me, or would be in front of you. Um, so I can very easily see everything. If I was going to change anything, this is also what I would change is I would make the back half of this desk actually angled. It's like to where the front flat part Let's do it this way. This is like the front half of the desk um, sitting here. This would be flat and then I'd angle the back half. So it goes up a little bit, just more of like a console shape, but really subtly that would let you see some of the gear a little bit more easily. Um, you know, if I did have, I don't have a lot of gear in here with a bunch of knobs and things I have to deal with. I have like a monitor controller, converters, a power conditioner. And if I was going to add anything else to it, it'd probably just be like, if I was recording a lot, I'd add like a four channel preamp or a stereo compressor. Um, so it's very easy to access the gear, control it. I don't have to move it all. And it's really comfortable. But I would take that design a little bit further, add some angles and things, which I think acoustically would also be beneficial. Um, but just make it a little little cooler looking and a little bit more functional. Uh, I, I think know. it looks awesome. Otherwise, I mean, it works great. Yeah, I think it. I mean, it's. I think it's great. It's. It's. It looks very minimalist, and some people dig yeah. that stuff. You know, so um, uh, from that perspective, I think it's pretty great. Yeah, cool. I love it. It's a. Uh, it's been cool. I don't know. It's a yeah. desk. It works yeah. well, and it doesn't yeah. have a big sound. Most importantly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Make sure if you DIY your own desks, make sure you build them heavy. Uh, don't go for like flimsy, super thin material. Don't do that. Just go heavy. Go heavy right from the yeah. start. This next one is by Mr. Racer. Awesome series. When you checked your predictions for how much the lowest value peak to highest value peak difference was, you have that number that REW showed. Why is that? It's at around the, some point in the video. Pumped for the next part. Cheers. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's just a matter of like when you're when we're looking at like the frequency response of the room, we're normally talking about like plus or minus uh, a certain value. So plus or minus five dB would mean you know that if you have a frequency response where the peak is at eighty dB and the lowest null is at seventy dB, there's ten dB between those two. And that gives you a value of plus or minus five dB. So it just gets divided by two. Um, that's how most, if you're looking at like measurements for a microphone or a piece of gear, it's always, or a speaker even, the values are always given like plus or minus three dB from 20,000 Hertz to 20, 20 Hertz. Um, yeah, it's because we're, we're looking just, at a swing around an average, right? And so one, so it's kind of, a, we kind of established that that's how often how we describe it. How much is the swing up? and below that average value that we're 
targeting that we're aiming for, right? And so it's oftentimes we'll say plus minus five dB or ten dB peak to peak. It's uh, I think it's also from from um, um, if you have an electrical background and an electronics background, that's a lot a lot of times that's how you describe um, that's how, how you describe a waveform often yeah? or the the amplitude of a waveform. So this next one is by PB Wavelengths. Awesome video. I wonder about the pink fluffy behind the corner traps. Did he completely fill the air gap with plain old pink fluffy stuff? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. Yes. I did. I, there's like, I think the only thing really to note is um, you don't want to compress it. So like there, you will actually reduce the effectiveness of fluffy insulation if you start compressing it and like shoving in as much of it as you can. So you want to give it some room where it's occupying its full depth, whatever, you know, the depth of the insulation is that you have, but don't compress it at all. Um, so I didn't like go back there and like shove it into every little nook and cranny. They're, you know, eight foot long pieces that we basically hung um, back there. And yeah, they're just kind of filling up that whole cavity. Yep. Cool. So moving on to the questions for video number four about our, uh, your membrane traps. This first one is by Brand. Great video, thanks. One question, is there a reason you focus mainly on base traps and hardly ever choose to go with thinner absorbers for the mids and highs? Would this kind of absorber be more relevant in a hi-fi listening room environment? There is absolutely a reason we uh, mostly use base traps and it's just what we really want is as broadband of an absorber as possible. Uh, when we start looking at thinner, two inch deep, one inch deep, treatments even four inch deep treatments they're they're not nearly as broadband um and they're basically a high frequency listening. high frequency and mid absorbers right yeah. exactly and so what you know base trap is like just really more broadband absorber in terms of like how we're talking about it um so yeah we don't use them because they're only going to target or only be effective at a certain frequency range and it will leave the low end in the room completely untreated uh and that doesn't give us an accurate monitoring environment that will translate well um, and give us a, you know, the listening and uh, experience that we're typically looking for. In a hi-fi room, things are a little more flexible, I would say. You know, you don't necessarily need great translation because you're not mixing a record or producing a record and needing the accuracy. Um, it's why hi-fi speakers and studio reference monitors are not the same thing. Uh, hi-fi speakers are designed to sound good and to be more of like a pleasurable listening experience. Whereas if you had a hi-fi room, I would probably not recommend you put these ATCs in there. ATC makes great hi-fi speakers, but like the ATCs in this room are very, are meant to be extremely detailed and extremely accurate and revealing, not necessarily, you know, have like a house curve or an EQ curve to them. That's more pleasing. So like a smiley face or something like that. Um, all that to say, you can, you can treat your hi-fi room a lot more so to your taste. And oftentimes, in my experience, that also comes down to the aesthetic of the room. Uh, even if it's a dedicated listening room, a lot of people don't want big treatments everywhere because uh, not the feel that they want for the room, which I get, but there is a compromise to that. And that's everything that we just talked about where you're going to have an absorber that's only going to work uh, at high and mid frequencies. So... We use base traps because they're the most effective treatment available and they're the one that works, you know, top to bottom from the frequency spectrum the best. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's, uh, I'll leave it at that as well. Could add a ton, but I think you answered it brilliantly. So let's just leave it at that. This next one is by Fonte King. Awesome end to the series. Congrats. Two questions. Would you do a video explaining how to do a DIY membrane trap? And would you do a tutorial for the cloud with lights? Thanks for everything. Great team, you and Yesco. Hope you do more videos together. Um, I think the membrane trap is a little tricky just in terms of like, I'd love to make a tutorial or a guide or resource on how to do it. But the materials that are used and the math behind it is very specific. And so... Uh, getting that to work and to translate to people all over the world can be challenging because if you start building them to different specs, they're not going to work and they're tuned to a very specific frequency, frequency as we showed in the last video. So it's, it's a hard thing to break down and make 
sure that it would actually be effective for anybody, regardless of where they're building or what materials that they have available to them. Fortunately, like acoustic panels or porous absorbers are, are quite simple in their nature and how they work. So we don't have that problem there. Um, so it's something that would, I think we would both <clears throat> really like to do. Whether I mean, or not we can actually do it is another is another question. Yeah, I mean, it's it's in in um, in one way, it's how we first got in touch with each other, right? Yeah. Because uh, I made a video at some point saying anybody who wants to like get in touch with me, and then Graham basically contacted me, and that's how we got started. Um, and so, long story short, we would both love to make instructions on how to build your own resonance absorbers. My ambition with the whole thing is though that it needs to work. I need, if if I put something like that out there, I need to know that 90% of the people building this thing are gonna get the results they intend. And that's hard to do. There's, it's sort of the, the, the kind of the, the upfront work to get to that point on our side is very high. Um, doesn't mean that we're not going to do it. Uh, it just means that the threshold for us to jump in and do it is much higher. And uh, a lot of stuff just has higher priority for us. So uh, long story short, we're definitely, we've thought about it. We've, I mean, we've talked about it off camera a ton already. So it's, this isn't, it's not like we haven't thought about this. Um, quite, quite the contrary. Um, and it will probably happen eventually um, when and exactly and how that exactly comes together is a different question. But um, yeah, it's uh, just know that it's, it's uh, yeah, we'd love to do it. It's not easy. If we, if we can, we will put it out. Um, but talking about the the absorber with the lights in it, yeah, the ceiling um, I'd say probably. <laughs> I'm not making any promises. Um, that it's something that we can definitely do. I there's like similar. It's not nearly as complicated, but it, it is just sort of a matter of you can do it with all sorts of different lights. You can do it. Well, there's one way that we do it with the like the lights that we have in here. Um, so hopefully we will make a video about that. One day, but to be determined. T DVD. <laughs> got a lot of other videos we got to make first. Exactly. Lots um, of other interesting things we want to talk about first. Yeah. Yeah. But good. To, good to know. I mean, and anybody watching, if there are certain things you'd like us to make to, to talk about more, uh, let us know. And obviously, if uh, enough people ask, uh, that obviously means the demand is there, and that will push it up in terms of priority for us as well. For sure. Uh, next one is by Angelo Baltini. How would you, I guess we had a, did we have a question by him already? Uh, how would you place membrane absorbers for similar modes on two axes? I imagine in the corner, but a diagonal setup like that would possibly be further away from both surfaces. Let me read that again. How would you place membrane absorbers for similar modes on two axes? I imagine in the corner, but a diagonal setup like that would possibly be further away from both surfaces. I'm not sure I understand I, the question exactly, I, but go ahead. Yeah, let's make it. Let's let's have an. Let's have a. So he's saying ahead. similar similar room modes, but like so a like front to back, let's say at 50 hertz, and a left to right at 55 hertz. I guess so. Is that? Yeah. That was, I th think that's, that was my interpretation of it at least. Yeah, so guess, in that case, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like we, I mean, m much like we talked about in that fourth video, um, you want each of the traps to, and they would be tuned to two different frequencies. So like that's far enough apart to where 55 Hertz would have its own boxes and 50 Hertz would have their own boxes. Mm -hmm. And you'd want each of those placed in the room at where you have the highest pressure level. Um, so that would mean, you know, in, in, if it's left to right, I would put them on both the left and the right walls. I wouldn't just treat the left wall with them. If it's front to back, you have a little bit less of a symmetry concern there. Um, so you could either treat just the back wall as we did or just the front wall. Um, but making sure that you find an experiment in your room with those high pressure areas and placing them there. You can absolutely put membrane traps in the corners. Um, Corners have bigger pressure buildup. So if that's where those are occurring, then great. It comes down a little bit to like, what is the mode? And by what is the mode, I mean, is it an axial mode or a tangential mode? Um, 
oblique modes I wouldn't typically treat with membrane traps because they just have lower a lower amount of energy, energy. Mm -hmm. um, and are normally is problematic. So tangential modes that can be very helpful. Axial modes I find it tends to be better by just placing as much as you can on the wall because we're talking about really big waveforms. It's not like you can just treat an area that's this big and be like, yeah, I took care of 50 hertz. Um, that 50 hertz energy is just like moving across the room in one big wave. And so the more area on that boundary that you can treat for it, the better. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, yeah, do I have anything to add? Anything useful? I don't think so. Let's just leave it at that. I think good answer. Um, next one is by Paul Bishop. Thanks for the video. Any specific build details? How do you determine the correct tension of the MLV attached on the front of the resonator box? Thanks. Yeah, so like we talked about, we don't have like specific build details because it's uh, kind of dependent upon the actual material that's used for the membrane. That's th that's the biggest factor. It's hard to like really predict, can everybody find the same densities of those things and then determine the tuning for it. In terms of tensioning the membrane, um, the you don't really want it tensioned or like you don't want to pull it tight. And it's also a membrane that's pretty dense and heavy. So it's not like you can really stretch it like fabric. Um, so what we'll typically do is just lay it out on a table, set the box that it's going with on top of it. So we're not like pulling it tight and wrapping around there. Um, it gets glued and then framed onto that box itself. So there's no real tensioning to it. You don't want it like super floppy and wavy. Um, but you also don't really have the ability to pull it tight. So it's just kind of a matter of leaving it in its state and putting something on top of it. You can do it in the opposite direction, but it's just kind of a matter of letting it letting it be as flat as possible without tensioning it and without letting it be wavy. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> this next one is by Andrea Scoglosa. Sorry if I butchered your name and anybody else whose name I butchered in this, uh, yeah, in this I'm, video. I'm glad, I'm glad you got that job. <laughs> I'm, I'm carrying that load on my shoulders. It's very heavy. <laughs> it's been a pleasure, pleasure watching all four videos start to finish. Thank you very much, guys. You're very welcome. I have a couple of questions. Two questions. Why make four membrane traps at 32 and four at 64 hertz instead of simply making eight at 32 hertz since 64 hertz is the second harmonic of the 32 hertz? Hertz axial room mode. Let's answer that one first. Um, well, I think you, they're on the right track. You absolutely could make all of them at 32 hertz. Um, but because they're tuned to specific frequencies and you would have a bigger, you would have an effect at 64 hertz, whereas if you made them all to 64 hertz, you wouldn't have really an effect at 32. Um, so you can treat the fundamental in that way. But if you want to target it and get more impact at 64 hertz and go beyond what you can accomplish it just by just treating them with 32 hertz traps, then you'd build them at both frequencies. And so it's really just a matter of how much can you actually accomplish. Um, well, one is the octave above the other, but the way that they interact in the room isn't so much so if you just eliminate 32 hertz that that goes away. Um, and so building both is just a bit more of a targeted approach yeah. and ultimately gives us a better result. It, it, and also, as so, so many times, it's a it depends answer because it also depends on how this, this exact tra trap is built, as in how narrow is the absorption peak, if you will, how broadband or narrow is it? Because obviously, if you build it too narrow to hit the 64 hertz, it's not going to do anything. If you build it broad enough so it hits both, it's probably not particularly effective. So there's a there's a trade off there, and so uh, that's why it becomes an it depends answer. Um, I'm just seeing that the second question is about the the density uh, of your porous absorbers of the material. So we answered that. So in the in the sake of brev brevity, I'm gonna just refer you back to that answer. Um, moving on to a question by George Gutierrez: How much is enough? It's like a param parameter or something like plus minus four dBs less than X amount of milliseconds, kind of flat. That's a difficult, difficult, difficult sentence. So I guess this is how much is enough in terms of treatment, but reaching a certain um, 
frequency response, flatness, and um, uh, decay time. I feel good with my acoustic treatment. It's close to the one you show in the last video. But I can't stop adding and moving stuff even if my mixes are tra translating well. Also, it would be great if you can show us how to make membrane traps. Ha! Um, but yeah, let's talk about um, how much is enough. If you can, you and this person can't stop adding and moving stuff around, even though the mixes are translating. Maybe, well, yeah. Go ahead. I was say if your mixes are translating well, you have enough. Yes. Um, you know, <laughs> maybe the problem flat, is in the treatment. <laughs> having having a flat room or a well treated room is always there to aid in like the creative process into your ability to mix well, produce well, record well. Um, it is the thing that lets you be you as like a creator more than anything else so that we're getting yeah. everything out of your way so that you can create the music that you're wanting to. Or if you're just listening, you know, like in a listening room that you can hear the music as impactful and as, as emotional as it can be. Um, so you get the full experience of it. If the room is working well for you, you got enough. Yeah. Um, if you're constantly distracted by the fact that like, Hey, your frequency, your frequency response isn't super well balanced, or there's this one thing that's resonating, then you don't have enough because it's distracting you and not letting you focus on what matters. Um, so in terms of the more technical, you know, in an ideal world, every room would be like plus or minus three DB, um, at like one third, one twelfth octave band smoothing it, you know, in actuality, most, don't really get all that close to that. Um, really, really well treated rooms, you know, like as we showed it in this case, like you can you can get pretty close to that. Um, plus or minus five dB or so at like one twelfth octaband smoothing. But it's uh yeah, enough enough is like whatever works well for you. Yeah. Um it's a very, more very difficult the room is. very difficult answer to a uh, question to answer. Yeah, because um it's it's because it's goal orientated, right? enough to do what enough to get your mixes trans to translate then you're already there enough to get into a flow state and enjoy your room if you're constantly distracted by something even though your mixes are translating then it maybe it's still it's still it isn't enough enough to reach a certain technical standard well then you probably don't have enough yeah but what's the point of reaching a certain technical standard on its own right so um yeah, so this this question is very open ended. It depends on what you're trying to do. Yeah, um, is it enough for your particular purpose? Uh, that's yeah, that's something you really have to answer for yourself, right? And like, what are you trying to do from with that with that room? Yeah. Um, but yeah, moving on great. to yeah. Tom Waller, another great video. After I treat my room with bass traps, I might look into building some of the membrane traps. I have space budget. I'm in the same boat as many other people in the comments here would love some more in-depth construction details like this. Yes, go. You have done with the broadband bass traps. Yeah. Um, noted. <laughs> this next one is by... Oh, this is the different... I've seen this name before. Hischian... Actually, hold on. Can, can we yeah. go back to that real quick? Yes. Because it seems like a lot of people want to know how to build these membrane traps. Yes. Not to say that this is how they will be built, but if everybody could like, I think one thing that would be very helpful in terms of facilitating that is we need to know like what materials people have access to, particularly mm. for the membrane. Mm. So wherever like, you you know, the membranes that we used here were we used mass loaded vinyl. Um, that's a pretty readily available material, but the weight of it is what's really matter or important. It's like the density of it. So if it's something that like you really want, if they can leave, like if Google or search, like what densities they have available to them um, and leave that in the comments that would, and like where in the world they are be very helpful in terms of like understanding how practical it is to put a guide together that based off of that information. Yeah. And use that point. as a resource because it's yeah, yeah. ultimately something that would have to be a resource of like, here are the materials that are available in your, um, you know, area of the world. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and then is what yeah. makes it hard for us to it's, actually put together. It's definitely a good starting point to have a, a bit of an overview of what, what people have available. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, moving on to this next one by again Christian Spuck Bistrischki. Sorry about that, dude. Awesome video once again, guys. I noticed that the slats of the scatter faces on the gobos in Graham's room follow the same sequence, but the panels aren't mirrored to one another. Whereas in Yesco's room and pretty much everywhere I've seen the binary amplitude diffuser, it's recommended to flip the pattern when placing two scatter face panels next to each other. How much difference does this make in theory and in practice? And is it even something worth paying attention to? Or are the differences between the two cases minimal? Thanks a lot. Keep it up. First off, you're incredibly uh, detail oriented <laughs> and observant because I didn't know that. Um, <clears throat> wasn't something I'd ever even thought of in terms of like where the scatter faces were to the left and the right. Um, I can, they I can, can be or if you want. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, the, the, the short answer is it probably doesn't matter. It's a, uh, it is a, a slight potential improvement uh, because what you can potentially get if you have the same sequence repeated over and over are lobing effects. But these things work at such high frequencies that those are probably not going to be particularly just like noticeable. Um, so that's why we flip it around every other panel, we flip it around to break up potential lobing effects. Um, but that's the, you have to understand that these sc scatter faces, these, I, I call them diffuser fronts, but a scatter face is probably a better name because they are a very, very simple type of diffuser. Um, and so it's not particularly, it's not like a great diffusion anyway. It is really just scattering. And um, any kind of potential lobing you're getting there is is probably negligible. Yeah. So I do that. I just say, if, if you ask me, I say, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, but is it going to change anything? Probably not. Yeah. Um these went on there. Obviously, I hadn't thought about it um, or ever looked at them, apparently. So <laughs> <laughs> I could work on how observant I am. I think, the, yeah, I think that was perfect. The only thing I'd add is like if, if people aren't familiar with what, what lobing is, is it when you look at like how well a diffuser works or how well it's designed, um, you basically want the diffusion pattern of it to look like a cardioid microphone. So yeah. where like instead of like a specular reflection where like the sound comes in this way and then gets reflected, hopefully this makes sense. If this is the angle where it like goes that way and then it comes straight back, you want it to make more of like a rounded shape. So you get like that cardioid like mushroom head shape. So everything's kind of being distributed or dispersed evenly. If it does this where it makes more of like a star or like jagged lines, then you get those lobes where you get a lot of reflected energy and then no reflected energy. So it's breaking it up, but not distributing it very evenly. Ultimately with diffusion, you want it to be as even as possible. Um, so if you do alternate them, you'd get potentially a little bit more of an even distribution, but it, these are really oriented or, or focused on high frequency information, as you said. And so um, you're not gonna notice a ton of that, that high up in frequency. Cool. So moving on to Simon Baxter music. Would the performance be better if you built complete false walls with similar depths of absorption and amount of diffusion? I think you call it inbuilt. That way the panels go all the way to the floor and ceiling and no gaps between panels since it's a complete wall and ceiling. Would you call it a room within a room within a room? I'm planning a, a, out a basement studio that will be very similar size room. So very curious what you would recommend. I think visually it would be much cleaner and perhaps the bass response much tighter. Loving the video series. Thanks for putting it together for us all. The Yeah, so the short answer is yes, it would be better. Uh, acoustically, the difference would be negligible. Um, you know, the, there's one inch between these panels. So not a, I, I have to like put my head in the right spot to see it. Um, it's only going to have an impact on the highest of frequencies potentially, but probably not something that you could even see in a measurement. Um, and so in this case, this is like pretty close to a full floor to ceiling treatment in everywhere that you could put it. Uh, to his point though, the, the bigger difference would be the look and feel of the space. So if you like the look and the feel of that more, by all means go for it. Um, it's what we'd call more of like a built, you know, like a built-in, 
um, type treatment where it looked like it was part of the wall. It's not really a room within a room because you're not creating a new room. Room within a room has more to do with isolation uh, and construction methods. So like actually framing out new walls, the whole thing, like truly framing out a new room. I think that's um, why he called it room within a room within a room. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Um, so not quite that far, just but more like built in or custom treatments. And you absolutely can do that. Treatment wise or acoustically wouldn't change much. Yeah, I mean, this is how studios have been built for decades. I mean, so as in you're spot on, and that's exactly what people do. Yeah, um, uh, one way to think about this or is to to think about the outer layer, the outer construction layer being the isolation layer, and the inner layer being the treatment layer. Yeah, that's maybe some people then back in the days they used to call it the outer shell and the inner shell. That's one way of also talking about it but um basically yeah that's how you uh that's how studios have been built for decades and uh ultimately if you want to go f all in go for it that's uh whether you you put that together on a, in a modular way from panels or you just go right from the start uh, that's up to you yeah but yeah go for it so actually let's wrap it up there i would say graham thanks everybody for asking and submitting your questions um, it's really, really interesting also to see what you guys uh, pick up on uh, and love how how, uh, how detailed you get sometimes. Um, so all that is left to say, I guess, is, again, Graham, thanks to you for putting all the effort in into uh, showing us in such detail and with such uh, persistence what you've done. And, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and of course. Let's leave thank it at you. that. Yeah. And uh, thanks, everybody, for the questions. This has been awesome. Yeah, exactly. So again, thank you, everybody, for watching. And uh, everything that you'll need and we talked about is linked below. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Peace. See ya.